So if we can spend about 15 minutes or, or so, uh, where I'm, I'll pose some questions and I'll direct them specifically at each one of the speakers. And, uh, and you can respond to them in any which way that you feel is appropriate. And uh, this is merely just to kickstart uh, some discussions. And, and I know that there is a hell of a lot to cover and we're not possibly going to be able to do that uh, given the time frame. And then the remaining 15, 20 minutes or so will open up, uh, we'll, we'll take the questions that are coming from the audience. So I just want to say at the outset that some of the key themes that appear to be coming out, uh, especially in terms of Fatma's presentation and uh, what uh, Danish had been discussing earlier, you know, and, and, and to an extent, and very much also in terms of Rashi's uh, presentation, uh, you know, that these three overlapping dimensions of violent infrastructures, violent urban planning regimes, and also very violent space of law, which comes through very clearly in, in Fatima's. Uh, in Fatma's presentation, which is something that uh, Gulnaz and I do understand very, very, uh, very clearly because we ourselves have been involved for the last 20 months in a displacement project based here in Karachi. So there are so many overlaps. It's, 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 it's uh, very important uh, to just highlight those. And, uh, so, and, and all of this also dovetailing uh, with, you know, I think this broader terrain of a very fragmented form of governance. And uh, how we might conceptualize that is, is uh, you know, an open-ended. And, uh, and secondly, the question of out-migration, which uh, Rashi has highlighted, which also comes up in Fatima's presentation. This, of course, the displacements, the evictions, the constant uh, violence of all of this, which is pushing people to the margins, whether that's the periphery or the edge, or into this uh, agrarian space that itself is in a, in a process of transition across South Asia. Uh, so these, these are some of the important themes that are coming through. And I think that most of all, uh, the very deep connectivity uh, between housing, livelihoods, transport, and that these three things are ultimately also very deeply connected with climate change. And, and that this relationship cannot be uh, sort of compartmentalized, that in order to address climate change and urban violence dynamics, we need to see sort of uh, these, these four dynamics as co-constituted and precisely how to do that, those are the challenges that, uh, that, we, that we see before us. So let me begin first by asking uh, Vinesh a question. Uh, you know, Vinesh, in, in terms of uh, your discussion on, on the conflicts and the migrations and the displacement dynamics that you have been uh, researching and, and uh, writing about for, for quite some time now in Colombo, that the, the question of the conflict between uh, multilateral agencies such as the World Bank, what, or is there a conflict with, in terms of priorities and visions vis-a-vis -vis these infrastructural projects and local government systems or national government systems in terms of policies that on the one hand address issues of making Colombo a world-class city where you have adequate infrastructures, et cetera, doesn't even necessarily have to be a question of world class, more, the, more so the issue of adequate infrastructures that, uh, that uh, sustain mobility, that facilitate mobility and different kinds of mobilities. That on the one hand, and then the government's own climate adaptation and mitigation regimes uh, or policies, where are the gaps in all of this? And who actually is their ownership in a sense uh, in terms of uh, what is unfolding before you uh, you know, the uh, on-ground realities and then the, the broader discourse, uh, you know, at the top vis-a-vis -vis climate change, mitigation and adaptation issues. What are the gaps, if any, that, uh, that you can see? And, you know, I, I, we would love to know uh, a little bit more about that. So if you can take about uh, two minutes or so talking, telling us a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Naushin. Uh, I'll try to answer that um, tough question. Um, I'm not a World Bank representative, so I, I'm not speaking in behalf of the bank or the government. Uh, when I was doing some of my research involving the bank, uh, I came across um, safeguards that they were using. And those safeguards were always embedded on uh, national laws and national laws in that way, government departments, ministries, or all need to uh, comply with it. And 
currently, recently, they have um, they have released a new set of social um, safeguards called uh, environmental and social frameworks. Um, it has 10 standards, um, very advanced. And I actually used two of them, the labor standards and uh, community health. Uh, very, very tough. I mean, very stringent. It's a very tight net they, um, they're, they're using. So when you, um, when the World Bank, I would assume when the World Bank comes with their projects and they use, this is actually the book, this one, um, they, they build in standards like this. It is, it may be tough for ministries, departments to implement because there are the, the buy is so high. And when I was speaking with the Metro Colombo, the MCUDP project, when I was uh, in touch with them, they did say how, to what, to how much length they had to go. So you, you spoke about conflicts and all that. I didn't come across conflicts. I did come across some uh, push and pushback because the bank would say, we want these, 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 High standards, and then the government would say, "Look, this is just practically, you know, it it's just not possible. Let us, you know, adjust, etc." Um, those were some broad observations I I came across. Um, climate change, um, climate. Uh, there is a particular uh, entire section here on relation to environmental safeguards. Etc. The the project I did look at had a flood control uh, aspect to it, and some of those projects were directly trying to address um, aspects related to uh, people facing floods. Uh, they were living in riverbanks, etc., and and directly, yeah, due to um, impacts the rain uh, the rains uh, uncontrollable rains uh, and the rivers getting high etc and the floods when they would um, through the canals would come upstream and come into these communities uh, in fact one we looked at uh, the water would come in and it would stay inside the houses for two three days and people would um, have to move out or they would if they had a second story, they'd have to move to the second story. And so at those times you had diseases coming, uh, people had rashes in their legs, et cetera. Uh, these are all uh, aspects, climate, the rains, the rivers, um, water coming in and health, um, sicknesses, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, I hope that okay. answers the question. Yeah. It's helpful, definitely helpful. I, I know there's a lot more that we can get into vis-a-vis -vis that, but for now, uh, I, I think we can leave it at that. But thank you, Dinesh, that's very helpful. Fatma, a question for you. Um, you know, in the course of your uh, excellent research uh, in Lahore on this particular case uh, that you've been investigating in, uh, what, what is your uh, sort of, what is your experience? I mean, what do you see happening in terms of, the governance dynamic. So, you know, the different agencies, the different state authorities, state officials is involved in this. Then you see the, the legal dimension of this form of displacement as well. And then alongside that, uh, there are there is progressive legislation in Pakistan specifically that Thank you for that question, Nasheen. Um, so to answer the latter part of your um, question first, I think that uh, people who've lived for a very long time in communities, uh, they're always going to have grievances when they are displaced from that. 
Um, so there's the monetary aspect and then there's the emotional and the affective aspect, right? So you can deal with the, you can address the monetary aspect and the, these two aspects are not mutually exclusive, right? Like if you pay people enough, they'll be happy to break up the community, uh, sort of leave the community or, or at least that's, uh, it is in some, in some ways for a lot of people, a question of rights. So for instance, in my field work, it is not that uh, people were irrationally or, you know, what do you you would say in the economic sense irrationally or um, uh, attached to their properties or they would refuse to move. It's just that they, they wanted to be compensated well enough to make up for um, not just the monetary loss, but also the loss of having to leave their ancestral homes, right? So I think that there will always be some dis dissatisfaction with such uh, projects that affect a large scale and or massive displacement, but we can come arrive at results that are far more equitable than what we see in this case. Because in this case, people suffered a lot of monetary losses as well. Many of them who were homeowners in the city, in the center of the city, became renters and tenants now, right? Uh, so that has caused um, a lot of disturbance in the social economic status, right? So just the monetary aspect and I'm, the, the emotional and the affective aspect of it is also deserves a lot of attention, but like the most immediate aspect of this, uh, aspect of this is the disturbance it has caused to their uh, financial standing. So that could have been addressed in a much, much better way. Um, one of the key, one of the ways in which uh, it could have been addressed was to um, grant people, give people the same comp compensation regardless of the ownership papers, right? Um, not have a separate charity fund, which had a much, uh, which gave out a lot less money than the Land Acquisition Act. And then again, um, the Land Acquisition Act in itself uh, is, is followed pretty much in Punjab in its, uh, in its original form, which was formed in 1894, um, over a hundred years ago. And under that, uh, there is not, within that act itself, there is not a lot of resettlement um, options that are given. Um, it talks about compensation. So the details, the bulk of the law talks about how to compensate people, the kinds of notifications that you need to issue, the kinds of procedures uh, people have access to, how, do, how can they appeal their compensation that, they has, that has been made, how do they appeal the decisions and stuff. But it does not talk about resettlement. And I, even though I spoke to a lot of LD officials and people who were involved in the project, they said that the resettlement, uh, resettlement in the sense of giving people alternative housing was never like a question that was seriously considered. So I think okay. some combination of monetary compensation plus a resettlement scheme would produce an outcome that is far, far better than what happened right now. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Fatma. Uh, answered really, really well. Uh, and I'll turn now to Rashi. So Rashi, uh, there's so much in your presentation that one can linger over for a very, very long time, but we don't have the luxury of uh, doing that today. But so I'll just pose uh, one question, which has two parts to you. So one is that in terms of what you are seeing happening on ground, in terms of the campaign, in terms of your interventions and your longstanding uh, relationships with uh, communities and uh, in neighborhoods, uh, residents on ground, what kind of solidarities do you see emerging if there are any in this particular pandemic moment? And alongside those solidarities of communities or people within communities coming together, uh, are there possible fractures as well that are evident? And, and also, are people indifferent to the coronavirus? Because that is certainly happening in Pakistan. So, uh, you know, we have uh, situations, we have several situations that we've come across in Pakistan where we're hearing about and we are reading about uh, where people actually just don't believe that there is a pandemic issue and, and don't know what the coronavirus is. Or, do, or if they know, if they've been informed about it, they don't believe it. So that's one part. So, and this, that's the, the view from the ground. And the second is the view from, from above. And, and just, I mean, this is like, I know if this is too long-winded, you don't have to answer all of it. Uh, you've had sort of an opportunity to sit inside government in terms of being seconded by, by the Delhi government to, to be in charge of, of some of the relief uh, measures, those, those, especially those, I, I know we talked about this very briefly in our email communications, for those particular segments of the population that did not fall into the state's own uh, ambit. Uh, what are some of the challenges, some of the gaps that, that you can see from that, from that perspective? So you have the, the privilege of sort of seeing it from the ground and then seeing it from, you know, from sitting inside the state, if one, can, if one can say that. If you could just tell us a little bit, just very briefly, on these two points. Thank you. 
Um, so yeah, for your first part of the question about solidarity is being built. So what we've seen really is, and even the Indian Supreme Court has kind of lauded the sort of civil society organizations and volunteers that have really come out on the ground to offer assistance. Because we've said that informality works in such, in such ways that it will fall off governmentality you know it will uh, it will be very difficult for government to be present because they have withdrawn from these spaces long ago really and just have said that uh, you know these are illegal spaces or these are spaces that are being used by encroachers like i mean for example in the delhi master plan urban informal settlements are either left blank or they are shown as green cover so you know like there is such severe invisibilization of uh, you know and also the courts taking on sometimes really anti-people stances anti-poor stances to say that you know people who live in bastis are encroachers so there is that and therefore those solidarities within these networks have, are the ones that have come into play really right now because uh, Delhi is one of the places in one of the hotspots in India apart from Mumbai where the coronavirus is really exploding and our cases are really going up and the infrastructure just cannot um, you know we do not have the health infrastructure to sort of accommodate that many people so I mean that's where you know even in my presentation I said that you know corona did not break the system you know the system it just exposed a broken system that existed so with the Delhi government or with the government of India you know we've got that parallel system the Delhi government did put in uh, you know suddenly very quickly realized say for food security that there were people who are migrants who come into the city who do not have any kind of identification to prove that they live in the city you know so they were getting left out of our pds which is the public distribution system uh, uh, to get to avail food and they were getting left out of that uh, system completely so suddenly you have a large number of people who have no sort of you know no rental agreements no sort of id cards that can really prove that they even exist in the city but they do and uh, the government had to really quickly come in and set up uh, the Delhi government to its credit did set up uh, you know lots of food centers uh, schools government schools were turned into food centers uh, where people could come and get cooked food uh, they also set up an SOS hunger helpline uh, which was delivering uh, ration kits you know to families in need and that was really identified by the civil society organizations so the government did try to work with the civil society organizations in this uh, and this sort of time to identify what the hotspots were. So it was this uh, activists and residents who lived there who really came up with lists very quickly and said, these are the families who have no food. These are the families who have no ID cards and they're gonna be left out of all government schemes. And so what we've seen is suddenly even people who live within Bastis, there had to be a very quick skilling that had to happen. You know, it was something that they had to very quickly learn. So they had to learn what numbers to call. They had to see, call up multiple channels and suddenly say, this is where, you know, we are in need and there's no food. We, the, you know, the center for the food, the cooked food is too far away. You know, Delhi, we have really terrible summers it's really hot we can't stand in the line to receive the food the lines were really long there was uh, difficulty in practicing social distancing so all of that did happen and of course there are cracks in our government you know because and that is nothing to do with the you know i mean we have the current government also trying to pave you know or try to fix these things but because if we have not really thought about it in a long sort of a way like you know then we are never going to be able to address these issues so a lot of people did fall out of the cracks a lot of people just didn't have faith in the government that they are going to actually yeah. get something and they started walking out of their homes with their bare belongings they just said we are going to go home even if we are going to actually see might get the disease or might not make it back home because it's 800 kilometers away and we're going to have to walk in the heat but people chose that instead of trusting the government and that kind of is something that you know in india we do not have that kind of faith within the government i think that citizens and that trust is really broken and it's uh, it's structured even more on the point of how people whether people think that corona is real or not in india we have a terrible media <laughs> uh, which really is into fear mongering so in fact we have too much information in india and too much fear which is leading to a lot of repercussions you know i mean there is 
there is of course religious intolerance which has grown in india terribly under our current regime that has been exacerbated you know and you have had certain religious minorities muslims being targeted caste minorities particularly vulnerable getting targeted women getting targeted more cases of domestic violence which the government just said we can't deal with this right now you know so certain uh, so those social fractures that exist in indian society can be seen even in these collaborations uh, within you know as social workers or as communities try to get together in this so those exist quite blatantly and can be seen so yeah fantastic thank you very much rashi so with that i'm going to move on to uh, the q and a uh, that uh, our uh, several audience members our participants have uh, posted so i'll start with a question that arsam salim has posted here in karachi and arsam asks uh, this is directed to you fatma he asks that in uh, your case study did you come across instances where uh, communities uh, had actually managed to mobilize uh, to uh, somehow resist the eviction drive and the resettlement process did that happen uh, why didn't it happen uh, this is a very long winded question so you don't have to get into it in great depth but uh, given the you know constraints of time but if you could just touch upon it yes um absolutely there was actually a lot of community organizing and resistance to the project and the evictions initially um so a lot of communities along the route were affected and a lot of these communities were in formal settlements where people did not have ownership documents so initially so there are multi there are multiple aspects to the resistance there was re resistance to the project just in general there was uh, because of, uh, the train line it passes very closely to a lot of heritage sites in lahore so there was a lot of uh, pushback from civil society activists against the potential damage that this construction caused to those sites right um so there was pushback on that front there was pushback uh, on the front um due to, due to the fact that a lot of informal uh, settlements would end up getting disrupted and a lot of people would be displaced and a lot of these people did not have ownership documents initially the understanding was that people who did not have ownership documents would not get any compensation at all uh, because that is how the land acquisition act works it was only after these people put up a lot of uh, resistance they there were there were rallies there were protests there were sit ins uh, road blocking and uh, they also reached out to opposition opposition political parties and then there were rallies in which uh, opposition political parties like the ppp and pti showed up and it was only in response to that that the chief minister set up this fund uh, to give some compensation to people who uh, even 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 if they didn't have ownership documents and uh, that resistance in itself is like an entire chapter in my dissertation because um as with all other um, as with all coalitions there are fractures within that and um, agendas change um so there's a lot there but uh, this is a short answer to the question oh no excellent thank you very much fatma uh, there's so much resonance uh, for the karachi context so mm -hmm. my uh, my my network connection is becoming unstable again so please bear with me so this next question is for uh, dinesh uh dinesh this is from eromi perora and eromi asks uh that uh, uh the 91 families that were resettled under the world bank project this was done after being forcibly evicted in 2015 by the military and safeguards were not followed this led to the community getting new housing of their choosing last year post relocation research has demonstrated that life deteriorated considerably for the community so what aspects of this relocation do you think were actually good tanesh yeah so mine was not a post evaluation of resettlement i was looking at the standards they had used the procedures and the procedures were quite stringent i have not spoken to those um those groups um that romi says um who were forced to be relocated she may be correct yeah i mean um, if they were then it's wrong i mean it's against the the criteria and the guidelines set by the bank yeah that's my answer okay great uh thank you the next question is actually for all of you and it's from sobia kakar and uh, sobia asks are there current forms of participatory planning alternative forums within informal settlements that need to be recognized more broadly in planning circles so uh feel free to jump in any one of you uh 
Rashi, do you want to take this one? Okay, sure. Um, there is um, when when the you know when we started our campaign, um, there was a lot of um, you know we when we talk about participatory planning, the tools and the language of planning itself can be quite difficult to understand. I myself do not come from a planning background. I'm a geographer. And it was really challenging to understand where, you know, what, where are the roads going to come? What is, you know, how does, you know, a whole city get sort of imagined on paper? And so it was very sort of, it can be, and it was very challenging to get into uh, you know, conversations uh, with, in say, informal settlements. But the campaign itself is informed by activists, many of whom live there. So, you know, if we were talking about, say, waste pickers and their issues of livelihood, then we had whole, we had, uh, you know, organizations populated with people who actually work as waste pickers come and inform us what their challenges were. And our challenge was to kind of say, uh, you know, and we had architects and urban planners uh, who were also part of the campaign who had to come together at loggerheads and say, you know, the plan is not going to solve everything. Like the plan is not going to look at minimum wage, but the plan can look at how the dhalaos of, you know, a, um, you know, of a landfill can be planned better so that, you know, waste picking can become easier, more dignified. So um, for us in the campaign, that is really where we come from and we were really particular about it and we are in the process of also creating new material in how do you go about facilitating uh, and talking about informality uh, and the formal logics in the formal logics of the plan so for us there have been you know more than uh, 2500 people have been reached out to in informal communities so every community meeting that we host is there so where we bring in the women come the men come and that facilitation happens where we say okay this is how the plan is going to affect your community how are you going to then place this in the larger community what are you going to sort of say and demand so travel is one livelihood is one uh, proper housing is the second so you know so those demands that we've created and we've put in front of the authorities come from there and yes it's a challenging thing to be able to talk about participatory planning especially because the language of planning can be quite alienating but uh, we've kind of sort of tried to break that barrier as much as we can and continuously bring back and say, not everything is going to be answered by the plan. This is what we can answer by looking at this right now. And for the others, the struggles will continue. You know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rashi. Uh, so I, I will pose, I'll ask one last question and then we're going to wrap up. So uh, this is for Fatima and this is from Sabah Aslam. So Sabah asks, uh, Fatma, do you also see local politics having an impact or perhaps mediating the negotiations that urban dwellers engage in to secure a place in the city of Lahore? Um, so um, I'll speak directly, uh, I'll answer this with regard to uh, the way people who were potentially, who are going to be affected by the Orange Line and negotiated with the states. And indeed, yes, local politics that play a huge role. Uh, so when the people started initially organizing against the project or to demand compensation or demand that the government change the route of the orange line, they contacted and they worked and they were in communication with their local MPAs, member, members of provincial assemblies and members of national assemblies from those areas, right? And it was these people who initially assured them that they would get some kind of compensation. And the way local politics played out in this in this case was that Kapurthala House in Old and Arkali area, it's a, it has always been a PMLN stronghold, Pakistan Muslim League Moon stronghold, which is the ruling party that initiated the Orange Line and um, who were in charge. And they were the ruling party at the time and they'd started the project, right? And a lot of people thought that um, it is because that place is the PMLN stronghold. Uh, people over there in Kapurthala House got a better rate. Um, I'm talking about the charity fund. Um, they got uh, 25 lakh per marla, whereas other people, for instance, in settlements like Parachute Colony, which at the time uh, was not a PMLN stronghold, and the local MNA and the MPA from that region was from PTI, the opposition party, Pakistan the Harikin Saab. And the people from that settlement thought that, you know, had our MP or MNA been from the ruling party, we might have gotten a higher compensation rate, similar to the one that people in Kapurthala House got. But we were a PTI stronghold. Uh, or, uh, you know, the local politicians in that area who were powerful and influential were from PTI. 
so uh, perhaps that worked against us but it also but then again um, uh, the parachute colony has also been sort of in the news previously because the local politician alim khan uh, who is a sort of a, a major leader in the opposition party pti he had worked to get these some of these people in parachute colony ownership doc, ownership documents and malikana hukuk that is on ownership rights right so that sort of um, area fell under his you know informal uh, you know area and so being under the uh, you know being one of the areas that were under the influence of alim khan also helped those people because they were able to get some compensation right but um, not as, as much compensation as people who had pmln leaders then so local politics played out um, in that this is one of the ways in which local politics played out yeah uh, thank you fatma i mean telling us once again that so much of these this politics is about the shifting terrain of the politics of patronage to, in south asia uh, okay so uh, with this uh, we're going to wrap up to i am so deeply deeply thankful to our three wonderful presenters here today banish Jatilaka, Rashi Mehra, and Fatma Tasaddeq, who shared with us a uh, really uh, powerful and uh, uh, thought-provoking presentations on different forms of displacement, the politics that uh, these, um, you know, these these dynamics uh, uh, sort of involve, and and of course the very complex issue of climate change that also dovetails with these different forms of displacement. So um, I, I thank all of you. I thank our audience also for posing terrific questions. Thank you so much.